Welcome back to the Riga Conference 2021. Uh, we're very pleased to see a big audience here with us today in Riga, uh, but also welcome to all of you joining online. I'm Stuart Lau, Europe-China correspondent at Politico, and I'll be moderating an event for uh, the next hour, which will focus on how Europe reconsiders the global order, US and China. So we'll have um, two distinguished scholars with us here today in Riga. Um, Dr. Sarah Kishberger, Head of Asia Pacific Strategy and Security at ISPK at Keele University. She's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. And we also have Professor Roberta Ha from Maastricht University joining us live today. We also have three panelists joining online. We have Jude Blanchett, Freeman Chair in China Studies at CSIS. We have Dr. Andrew Mishta, Dean of the College of International and Security Studies at George Marshall European Center for Security Studies in Germany. And we also have Henry Hand, Director of the Office of Chinese and Mongolian Affairs with the US Department of State. Um, of course, over the last few years, US-China relations has become such a big topic, and Europe is also watching with a lot of intense interest. Um, we've seen, for example, European Council President Charles Michel having his first one-on-one um, -on -one with Chinese President Xi Jinping just 24 hours ago, and not to mention, you know, the slowly intensifying diplomatic exchanges between the US and China uh, since the Biden administration. So we'll be discussing all these uh, very um, important topics in the next hour. So. Um, we would be going through uh, our five very distinguished panelists to see, to get a sense of how they see their particular area of interest, uh, ranging from security to politics to economic situation between the two uh, countries, US and China, and also giving a European perspective about how to approach these topics. Um, so we will start with um, Mr. Henry Hand uh, from the State Department to give us a sense, first of all, about how the US government, the Biden administration, is uh, addressing these issues uh, in relation to the China relations. So, um, Mr. Han, please. Hi, good afternoon. We share with our European partners the understanding that our relationships with China are multifaceted. And this was an important focus of the US EU, the G7, and the NATO summits that took place in June. The U.S. relationship with the People's Republic of China will be competitive when it should be, collaborative when it can be, and adversarial when it must be. We are working with our allies, partners, and friends to support an open, free, and transparent system of laws and norms. Together, we will compete with the PRC from a unified position of strength. Our shared vision for the Indo-Pacific is one that is governed by the peaceful resolution of disputes and rule of law, not coercion. Our vision includes transparency, rule of law, a vibrant civil society, and respect for basic freedoms. We believe that the Indo-Pacific region is stronger when we act together to solve shared problems, rather than acting alone to achieve goals that only benefit a few. These rules, which we hold dear in the United States and Europe, must also apply to the Indo-Pacific and globally. Certain negative PRC actions, such as its attempted economic coercion of countries like Lithuania, pose one of the most significant challenges to the rules-based international order and to our shared values and interests. The administration is investing in our network of alliances and partnerships in Europe and the Indo-Pacific region to build the global resiliency necessary to face this challenge. Standing together with our partners, allies, and friends, the United States will counter PRC attempts to utilize international organizations for narrow unilateral purposes, push back on non-market trade practices, secure critical supply chains, and protect sensitive technologies. We will continue holding PRC authorities responsible for the ongoing genocide in Xinjiang the trampling of autonomy and civil liberties in Hong Kong, and systematic repression in Tibet. We will bolster partners' capacity to resist PRC economic coercion and oppose the PRC's unlawful maritime claims. We'll also coordinate with Beijing when in our interests, such as on the climate crisis, counter-narcotics, and non-proliferation. As President Biden has said, 
We are not looking for conflict, but welcome stiff competition and will defend U.S. interests and shared democratic values across the board. These principles have governed our bilateral relationship with the PRC since the administration began. None of us could defend ourselves and our shared values and rules alone. We must develop strategic coalitions, partnerships, and alliances in key areas where the PRC wishes to coerce nations and multilateral fora into compliance with its own unilateral priorities. We can agree that the genocide in Xinjiang must stop and international condemnation is needed to press the PRC to end its repression of the Uyghur people. The EU has joined us and other G7 partners in declaring concern over erosion of Hong Kong's autonomy, imposing sanctions on those responsible for human rights violations in Xinjiang and cyber attributions. We are grateful for this cooperation and look forward to continued close, meaningful coordination to uphold human rights and shared democratic values and interests. We have seen growing awareness in the region of the risks of giving PRC companies access to critical infrastructure, including in Latvia, where the government joined us in calling for secure 5G networks. The PRC's recent bullying of Lithuania in response to their decision to deepen ties with Taiwan shows the need for greater US, EU, and intra-European coordination to build resiliency to PRC coercion and to deter the practice. It should be a country's sovereign prerogative to develop ties with Taiwan. A relationship with Taiwan can be mutually beneficial as well as help Taiwan to expand its international space in the face of PRC coercion. We look forward to the EU's release of its economic coercion toolbox and stand ready to assist in any way we can. By working together, we can protect our economies, principles, common national security interests, and most importantly, our shared values. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hand. If we take a look at the broader security issues, which of course matter so much to our audience here today, um, Dr. Mishta, why don't you give us a sense of your assessment of the broader security concerns between US and China and I think, you know, a lot of the audience would also be curious to find out from you the question whether Europe is prepared for this security situation in Asia Pacific. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to speak. I wish I could have joined you in person as uh, the conference is one of the best uh, I annually attend. And before I give my, my comments, let me say that I'm speaking in my private capacity as an analyst and my uh, my comments should not reflect the policy or position of the Marshall Center, the Defense Department, or the U.S. government. And to answer your question very directly, uh, the answer whether Europe is prepared, uh, my answer is no. Uh, we uh, have, I think, uh, a lot of work uh, ahead of us when it comes to fostering consensus across the Atlantic on the nature of the threat that China poses to the U.S.-led liberal open international order. I would also like to connect that piece to, uh, to uh, Russia, because I would argue that Russia and China are in effect in alignment in their opposition to the existing uh, liberal institutional order. Uh, Russia is a revisionist power. It wants to uh, revise the post-Cold War settlement, especially in Europe. Uh, China wants to replace uh, the existing settlement with one based on its values and its interests. Uh, just to quote uh, Secretary of Defense Austin during his hearings, uh, China is a pacing threat uh, when it comes to uh, U.S. military uh, power. And the pressure we see coming in from China, I think, demands that we uh, try to reach consensus across the Atlantic. What do I mean? Uh, the United States looks at China as both a military problem set and an economic problem set, and to a large extent also increasingly as an ideological challenge. Uh, the Europeans, on the other hand, while they admit that China poses a strategic challenge, they also see a huge economic opportunity here and want to stay away from any sort of hard security dimension of this great power competition in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the problem is that the two theaters, Europe and, and the Indo-Pacific, are interconnected, if for no other reason that we're facing two near-peer competitors 
uh, in, in Russia and China. So whatever happens in the Indo-Pacific will be connected to what uh, Putin may or may not try to do. And I will conclude my comment by saying the biggest issue I see in Europe is the lack of hard power. Uh, Europe has disarmed uh, for all practical purposes following the end of the Cold War. Uh, considering how the U.S. forces are structured today, where the challenges and threats are, where our focus is going to be, the kind of urgency of the Indo-Pacific theater, I think it's incumbent upon Europe to ensure that deterrence holds by rebuilding the European military. We will always be here for Europe. We will provide the enablers and the nuclear security guarantee. Uh, our forces are constantly training for reinforcement uh, and for operations across the theater, but Europe must do a lot of heavy lifting now to backfill against what the American forces are trying to do. And let me pause here, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mishta. And before we proceed, let me remind our online audience that we can use the hashtag RigaConf2021 on Twitter if you would like to post questions online, which of course we'll be taking um, towards the latter part of this discussion. Why don't we shift the attention to the stage and uh, have a more focused discussion on specifically Indo-Pacific with Dr. Kishberger. Of course, Dr. Mishta was talking about the security situation we are facing. Tell us more about what you see as the kind of areas where Europe and America might um, converge or diverge in terms of the Indo-Pacific. Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, yes, just picking up from where Andrew Mikta left off, um, I think there is indeed a huge problem with per at perception gap, as General Hodges also uh, explained yesterday, between the European allies and the United States on the one hand, but also amongst the, uh, the European allies. So this is a problem that we need to urgently address. And where does it come from? It's partly because of the differences in the geographic situation of individual countries. It's also because of strategic cultures or lack thereof in particular countries. And these are all gaps that can be addressed by gaining more of a 360-degree vision of the challenges that China poses, not just focusing on the individual challenges uh, China poses to some countries, but looking at the entire picture. So looking at the Indo-Pacific theater, what me as a China analyst and other analysts are worried about, it's uh, particularly the hotspots such as Taiwan, but also the South China Sea. And looking at Taiwan, I'm sometimes reminded of the situation with Crimea, because at the time of the annexation of Crimea, a lot of people seem to have been caught by surprise by the actions of the Kremlin, when in reality, most people who actually knew about the geostrategic situation of Crimea shouldn't have been so surprised, because Russia had a very strong interest in maintaining access to the Black Sea via Sevastopol and other reasons that were in place. And when we look at Taiwan, it's somewhat similar in the sense of what this island really means to China or to, C to the CCP in particular. So Xi Jinping has this huge project of rejuvenation. He wants to make China uh, a, a peer, at least to the United States, a power that is second to none by 2049. But Taiwan has a huge symbolic value for achieving that, so becoming unified with the mainland. But the other aspects that tend to be overlooked are the geostrategic value of this island as the cornerstone of the first island chain that basically fences in China's navy from hinders it from fully expanding. And also um, the, of course, ideological dimension Taiwan is a liberal democracy that poses a challenge to the legitimacy of CCP rule. So these, for all these reasons, Taiwan poses a huge problem to the CCP. It has been called an unsinkable aircraft carrier that is moored 100 nautical miles from the Chinese eastern coast. And actually, the Taiwanese foreign minister, Joseph Wu, has recently called Taiwan a sea fortress, something that is invaluable for containing the threat of Chinese expansion. So for all these reasons, China isn't very likely to back down. And Chinese strategists have long been arguing that without obtaining full control of Taiwan, in particular its eastern coast that faces the open Pacific, China will never actually be a great sea power. So we Europeans, we shouldn't kid ourselves regarding the seriousness of this potential uh, hotspot should it ever escalate. 
And I think the problem that we also have in Europe and that, that really has me worried is Europeans tend to think, very often I hear that from, from interlocutors, that a, any conflict in the Western Pacific would be a localized affair, something that the Americans would be involved in, but that would not really you know, uh, have any repercussions in a security sense on Europe. But that is most likely a wrong assessment. We've heard from the Deputy Minister of Defense for, of Japan that Japan fully expects that Okinawa would be attacked in the case of a Taiwan contingency because China, for tactical reasons, in their assessment would need to have control over Okinawa. So Japan expects to be involved in such a situation. And then we also know from studying Chinese military writings that they expect modern warfare to be like, and they think that uh, it would be absolutely essential to attack uh, critical satellite systems and cyber infrastructures for command and control and for reconnaissance and surveillance and so on in order to inhibit the operations of the networked American forces. So what we could expect to see in the, in the event of an escalation would be far-reaching attacks on all these types of infrastructure, satellite, cyber systems, and the NATO summit communique explicitly mentions that attacks of this type alone already constitute sufficient reason for triggering Article 5. Have NATO countries really thought through the implications of such possibilities. They may be very unlikely. This may be worst case scenarios that will never come to pass, but I'm worried that Europeans aren't doing enough and not worrying enough about what to do to inhibit them, how to uphold deterrence. So what can we do? I think Andrew Michter is absolutely right that Europeans need to bolster their own defense to account for the possibility of Russian and Chinese coordinated synchronized aggressions. That is definitely one thing to worry about. But the other thing is NATO also needs to think how to position itself in a way to make deterrence stronger, to signal to China that aggression isn't going to pay off, that this isn't going to be an easy victory, that this is going to be messy and costly and very uncertain in order to signal to China that is the better way to seek cooperation rather than conflict. Thank you, thank you, thank you Dr. Kishberger. And of course, you just also briefly talked about uh, how President Xi Jinping of China sees the world. So we have uh, an expert, Jude Blanchett, here with us today to tell us more about you know, Chinese political leadership, especially bearing in mind um, the a change of part of the leadership at least next year and how we should understand global politics in the context of that preparation for what's going to happen next year. But first of all, um, uh, Mr. Blanchett, why don't you tell us more about um, the Chinese leadership, President Xi Jinping's view of US relations and what sh really should Europe bear in mind here? Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak this morning. Uh, I should caveat this by saying uh, anyone who thinks they know what uh, what Xi Jinping is thinking, uh, I, I'd, I'd love them to also run my investment portfolio because they have a level of clarity and omniscience I don't. This is a, I think this is a really remarkable moment right now as we try to assess what's going on in Beijing. And Stuart, I appreciate the framing of your question. This incredibly important moment 12 months from now, roughly, when we'll have the 20th Party Congress and... Uh, I think arguably, I, I don't know anyone who's saying that Xi Jinping won't take a third term as general secretary of the Communist Party. And that opens up this really important question about um, how does the behavior of the Chinese party state change after Xi Jinping takes this third term? Um, just a few comments. And I actually wanted to, um, to, um, to, to link on to uh, Dr. Kitchberger's comments on, on Taiwan. But let me first make a few assumptions or guesses about how I think Beijing is, uh, is viewing the world based on its recent behavior. Um, point number one to me is, as I look at Xi Jinping's tenure in power over the past 10 years, I see an inverse relationship with how much power and authority he has over the bureaucratic system and how strategically smart China has been behaving. The more power Xi Jinping has over decision making, the more clumsy and chaotic I see the behavior of Beijing. 
This includes making rash decisions which undermine China's own longer term interests. We could take, for example, in response to joint sanctions over Xinjiang, uh, Beijing's own sanctioning of uh, EU officials, academics, which of course ended, as everyone in this audience knows, ended up pulling the rug out of CAI, which could have been a very strategically important wedge for China to leverage vis-a-vis -vis the United States and Europe. We see the crackdown in Hong Kong, which of course was a response to a more near-term problem, but that makes, to build on to Dr. Kitchberger's comments, if Taiwan is the big prize, uh, the crackdown on Hong Kong has made that prize harder to get because it has galvanized global opinion. It has uh, exacerbated opinion domestically in Taiwan. So the reason I raise this is if my mathematical inverse relation, uh, ratio is correct, after Xi Jinping takes a third term when he'll have even more structural agency over the party state, I'm very worried about how belligerent uh, Beijing will continue to act in ways that I don't think we quite imagine yet. Um, I'll come back to Taiwan because I have a slightly different opinion from Dr. Kitchberger, but nonetheless, just want to put that out there. Second point is, uh, you know, li listening to Henry's opening comments, what I thought was interesting is, I think both Washington DC and Beijing both simultaneously believe they hold the stronger hand for different reasons. But, but I think Beijing right now believes that it has the advantage of its domestic market, which is, uh, which although it growing at a slower pace is still of significant size, which it can leverage as a geostrategic weapon. And the second is increasingly Xi Jinping believes its governance system is a critical asset that gave, gives Beijing an advantage over quote unquote dysfunctional democracies in the West. I'm not making a comment on if he's correct or not, but certainly in the mindset of Beijing, they come to this not as the Beijing of 20 years ago where there, where there was a clear asymmetric relationship between the US and Beijing. I think Beijing sees itself as not totally a peer, but at least someone who deserves to be treated um, uh, with significantly more respect and deference than it, it believes Washington is. That, that means that the relationship is gonna be structurally more difficult for us. Um, and related to that, I see clearly a consensus in Beijing that especially now nine months into the Biden administration, um, it's old playbook of being able to either co-opt or influence an administration through leveraging its old friends or just ha having to sort of wait out the clock and get a new administration in which it could reset the relationship. I think Beijing believes rightly that the US has made a structural turn in how it thinks about the relationship with, Beijing, with, with China that isn't gonna change anytime soon. And so functionally, I believe Beijing is now, and this includes a lot of the new policies that we see coming out, especially the macroeconomic policies like dual circulation. Beijing is essentially digging in for a long fight and a lot of the, you unpack a lot of the policy frameworks. This is about domestic resiliency, securing supply chains, you know, reforging resilience within the, the party state apparatus. I think Xi Jinping is really restructuring the system here for a, a, a slog over the next 10 to 15 years where the international environment, as he says, profound changes unseen in a century, the international environment is not gonna get any better for, for China. Final comment, and then I will, I will shut up. Um, because Taiwan is so salient right now, I just wanted to, in the spirit of letting 100 flowers bloom, offer a slightly different take. Um, caveat this by saying there's a massive problem with Chinese coercion and saber rattling vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. My only slight difference with Dr. Kitchberger is, I see this as an unsettled question in Beijing's mind. I think this is for Xi Jinping fundamentally a political question, not just one of military capabilities. And as I think about his calculations vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, I look, at those I look at those along with all of the other policy objectives and goals he has for China. And right now, two propositions don't simultaneously sit together for me. One, that the, the core interest of the Communist Party is staying in power. And two, Xi Jinping is about to invade Taiwan. Those don't sit together to me because the absolute riskiest thing Xi Jinping could do 
now, next year, three years from now, is to launch an invasion potentially uh, 100 nautical miles from its mainland shore, uh, potentially bringing in uh, the United States as well as increasingly other partners and allies like Japan. I'm not saying this won't happen at some point. It's just, I think the near term focus for me, this is an empirical proposition. Is Xi Jinping going to invade in the near term? And as I kind of do the math on paper, I have a hard time squaring Xi Jinping's own political survival with an invasion of Taiwan. 10 years down the road, this, this may be a more tenable proposition, but, but I would hold right now the economic, political, financial, technological uh, uh, impact and, and uh, sort of knock-on effects for Beijing would be catastrophic. And then finally, I, I always ask the question of what's their occupation strategy? Um, what, what is, so, so day zero is, is hate, taking and holding the beach. I'm always very curious about what Beijing's day one to day end strategy is. Um, so I think there's a lot of, I, I, I share the, the extreme concern about how dangerous Beijing's behavior is right now and how fundamentally dangerous the gray zone pressure campaign, political warfare, cyber incursions, all of the incursions into the eight is over the past month and a half. I share all of those. It's just on that key question of what the heck does Beijing want to do to resolve the unification question? Um, I, I'm not as convinced that Beijing has made up his mind. And Xi's speech last weekend, where he essentially re he, he again came out with the peaceful reunification framing at the same time that they're saber rattling, actually shows to me that I don't think Xi Jinping really has a good strategy right now. So he is, he is functionally doing a few things at the same time without a really clear, um, without a really clear path to reunification. I don't, I don't think he's got a good strategy. But anyway, I, I'm uh, happy to be told I'm wrong. And, and with that, I will, I will be quiet. We will definitely get back to that question. And thank you so much for the rather comprehensive analysis. And uh, the question on Taiwan, as you said, is, is it matters a lot you know, to audience from both sides of the Atlantic. But as you said, you know, there's still a lot of unanswered question about what's actually in President Xi Jinping's mind, which apparently you know, very few of us probably have an answer. And uh, last but not least, we have Professor Roberta Ha with us here today. And we've heard you know, all the different perspectives from the US, from Europe, about you know, the question of China. Give us a sense of you know, how you see the European perspective is vis-a-vis -vis, you know, the US uh, strategic positioning on China. And do you think you know, Europe sees a lot of appetite in uh, maybe selectively coordinating with the US? How do, you, how do you sense this appetite being generated? Thank you, Stuart. Um, and thank you, uh, Riga Conference, for inviting me to be part of this very stimulating panel. I think we can all say that. Um, and I think it's a good order because, indeed, I think after um, this discussion about China and the US both thinking they have, they have the upper hand, and maybe I can start with that, the, you know, the rivalry between the US and China, where does Europe see that? And I have to say, as an American, I have a little bit of trepidation telling a European audience what they think, um, but I'm going to go ahead with it. And uh, we also heard yesterday with the Prime Minister of Latvia, he also pointed out that as far as a policy towards China, the EU doesn't have a coherent one. And if I look at, and do an analysis of what's out there in the, in the dialogue, I think I find three differing approaches to, to this rivalry. And the first one is a trade-centered, a trade-related approach. And the second is a security-related approach. And the third, I have labeled a French approach but then yesterday, listening to Mark Leonard, I thought maybe I could also call it a, a EU project approach. And the first approach, the trade approach, is really to carve out some sort of mediating position between the US and China. And I think nothing exemplifies this, this position more than the December of last year deal that the EU brokered at the end of the German presidency with China. And I know that some of the EU are boasting that this deal exemplified a strategic autonomy. And Biden, but Biden said that he would have preferred a united front of democracies to provide more substantial leverage uh, over China. In fact, Biden saw the investment deal with China as, directly, as distinctly unhelpful. And I think after some of the boycotts and the, um, the um, 
sanctions slapped on some of the MEPs, maybe Europeans see that Biden might have a point. But having said that, uh, most governments in Europe, they want a conciliatory trade relationship with China. They want to court its investment, they eye its market potential in both services and in uh, goods. And as The Economist pointed out in July of this year, China trades with, great, with a greater number of countries in the world than America does. So the Trans-Pacific Partnership was designed to do something about those statistics, but Trump killed that on his first full day in office. So, um, so I think that there are several ways that this relationship uh, affects Europeans, uh, and some have even called this an emerging Cold War with China, but none is more troublesome than the rivalry that the two have within Thank you, technology. Sir. We certainly have talked about technology at different times already at this, at this conference. And in technology, the rivalry really is the Biden administration has said that it wants to launch a techno-democracies versus a techno-autocracies campaign. And I do think the, the geopolitics of tech has several dimensions um, and certainly relates to the sector's impact on economic competitiveness, the size within the economies that these uh, technologies companies occupy. Technology is also linked to the second approach, the one on security, because it's intimately linked to national security uh, and future threats in a variety of ways, many that we've already talked about this conference already, ensuring uh, an essential access, uh, sorry, access to essential hardware, in particular microprocessing chips, also to the military capacity of advanced and sensitive technology. You talked about dual use technology, especially in the, one of the coffee break chats that was also part of what uh, was talked about. Quantum computing, artificial intelligence, all these things, but also through cyber crime, ransomware, so those sort of things, cyber terrorism, and the harvesting and using of, of data. So these security aspects of technology has prompted really techno-nationalism, uh, pushing for a greater control of technology within in countries, especially of sensitive and dual-use technologies. In the way of semiconductor chips, you have all the, the, um, the idea of, of self-reliance, and, and China, the US, and European countries are definitely wanting to increase our self-reliance because these chips and the shortage of these chips uh, wreck, are wrecking havoc across many industries. Uh, and also the security approach also means that EU leaders are focused on the Pacific because of this. I see we have one of the questions on AUKUS, and certainly AUKUS is, uh, is also one of the main ways of, of uh, looking at the rivalry as far as the military aspect and certainly what China is doing in, in the region. And now I want to talk about the third approach. Uh, certainly Macron said in 2017 after he took office, he talked about European sovereignty, he talked about a capacity to act autonomously, and again, these are things that we've talked about this conference. And certainly some member states are, are worried about this kind of language, and, and maybe even some in particular here in the Baltics. But what do all these three approaches mean? Well, the first views China as a possible partner, thus requiring Europeans to operate carefully between these two rivals. The second sees China definitely as a strategic competitor, a security threat, which necessitates forging new ties with America on a variety of levels. The third sees America as an unreliable ally for continental Europeans at a time of a rising China. Um, and certainly France argues that um, uh, it's an unreliable ally for continental Europeans um, uh, and that there's a trend uh, in the self-reliance. It's a long-term trend. And maybe if I could just end with maybe return to my American perspective and, and, and my home of uh, feeling more comfortable in American foreign policy, I certainly don't know what approach will develop in the future, but I do know that the recent missteps by the Biden administration uh, have created some criticism, some worry in, in allies, uh, uh, concerns about whether Biden is as sure-footed in international affairs as he claimed. However, Biden is not Trump meaning that he's not going to double down on his mistakes uh, or take out his little Sharpie pen and change the route of the hurricane. Uh, I think that he can change course, he can admit his mistakes, and I think this gives Europeans some flexibility, it gives you the possibility for more influence on what happens in the future of the rivalry, and maybe to have an influence, certainly if you have a coherent 27 nations, and I'll stop there. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for all our panelists. So uh, before we open uh, the Q&A session to the floor and to the online audience, I'll just uh, pick a few questions from uh, the comments we just heard. Uh, so uh, Mr. Hand, I mean, give us a sense of, you know, how the State Department sees this European airline, which is, you know, as Roberta ha, Dr. Roberta Ha was telling us, you know, um, at a time when Europe is still seeing U.S somewhat as an unreliable partner. It, it is an ally, it shares a lot of shared values, but in terms of how to handle China, they don't want to go as tough as the US is seemingly um, inclined to. So how do you, what is your approach, what is your strategy to try to convince your European partners here? No, oh, thank you for that question. Um, I think um, uh, Jude mentioned that, you know, both, uh, in his view, both uh, the U.S. and China feel, you know, they have the upper hand. Um, not surprisingly, um, you know, in this in this competition, uh, as a representative of the U.S. State Department, I, I do feel, you know, we have the upper hand because we have a lot of strengths. Um, and one of our greatest strengths is our partners and allies. And this is something that the Biden-Harris administration has been very clear in stressing. It's something that is, I go to far too many meetings and, and uh, events in the State Department uh, again and again, there's a strong emphasis on working with our partners and allies. Um, and and that, uh, that commitment is sincere, that commitment is real. Um, I spent four years in Beijing prior to this, you know, coming to this job this summer. And one thing that really struck me personally is, is when we took measures in conjunction with other countries, um, you know, they, they really did sort of magnify the impact. I think it increased the resonance with the Chinese and, and so on. So, um, you know, I would not regard the U.S. As, as an unreliable ally in this. I think that a core part of our uh, approach towards China is the working with partners and allies and, and certainly, you know, particularly with the EU and with European countries. I think we've seen whether it is on economic issues, whether it's on the South China Sea, uh, uh, with Taiwan right now, we are uh, working with our European partners and allies uh, to push back on Chinese economic coercion in Lithuania. Um, so, um, on regarding the the you know our commitment to our allies, our friends, our partners, and frankly, reaching out to other countries as well, uh, that is certainly uh, very solid. Right, so we've heard also um, uh, two sets of you know, reality checks about the Taiwan situation. I'm just wondering whether our two other panelists would also like to comment a little bit on, on the seriousness of, this, of, of um, the situation facing Taiwan and uh, you know, what the Beijing authorities are really thinking about when it comes to military preparation, if not military action. So um, Dr. Mishta or Professor Ha, would you guys also like to comment here a little bit? Well, I know I was recently at the NATO Defense College in Rome, and then I had a discussion there with, uh, we talked about Taiwan. It was very much on, on people's, well, people were very interested in talking about that. And they, people there thought, or different people thought, well, NATO wouldn't have any role to play with, with what, if something would happen with, to, with Taiwan, if there would be an invasion of Taiwan. And I said, well, I wasn't sure what would happen, but certainly you probably would not have said that NATO would have gone to Afghanistan, for example. Uh, before it did go to Afghanistan. So I don't know if, um, if, if, the, if that will play a role. I don't know, uh, certainly if, if NATO is, um, uh, the perception that NATO would go, that, that would also help with the deterrence. I think the, the points that were made about the, the, the you, you break it, you own it scenario, if they would actually invade Taiwan and what sort of occupation that they have is a very good one. I think that if you think through that, um, and then maybe also push with the deterrence with having other actors involved that could, that could be more effective. Right, and Dr. Mishto, we've seen uh, also, you know, when it comes to Taiwan, we've also seen uh, NAFO kind of um, preparation by the Brits, by the Dutch, or by the Germans, you know, also somewhere in the South China Sea, but not really going across the Taiwan Strait most of the time. Uh, how do you see, you know, European partnership in this regard? I think the British will definitely uh, work with us on this. And if you look at the British naval buildup right now, I mean, there's an aspect of this 
I am not sure about the other European uh, powers in that regard, but I'd like to make a, a, a comment, if I may, as I listen to this conversation. I'm struck by a relative lack of urgency and the kind of timelines that are being thrown of 10, 15 years, 30 years. Um, some of you may recall that Admiral Davidson testifying before Congress indicated that we may in fact be facing a kinetic conflict in the Indo-Pacific within seven years or so. I think right now that window has narrowed even more for a variety of reasons. The United States is coming out of two decades of irregular warfare. Uh, we are in the process of rebuilding our military, uh, our army, our Navy, our entire joint force for high intensity conflict, something that clearly uh, will shift the overall balance uh, of power. So if you look at the window of opportunity from the Chinese or Russian perspective, I would argue that sooner uh, rather than later would be when we might be challenged. Also, when we talk about Taiwan, uh, let's not get, let's not hyperventilate about invasions and occupations. There's a whole spectrum of actions that China may take to undermine the credibility of US security guarantees. And with that, uh, undermine the entire architecture that you have uh, in, in the Asia Pacific. Uh, so, um, I, for one, tend to think that the situation is much more dangerous than a lot of our discussion uh, here seems to indicate. And one comment I hear, strategic competition, great power competition, uh, I look at it differently. I believe we are in, in the gray zone conflict already with two near peer military competitors. Uh, and the problem is that if you believe that you compete and the other side is in effect at war below the threshold of kinetic engagement, then I don't think the outcome will be very fortunate. I think what needs to happen is a recognition of the intensity of the threat that we're confronting both in Europe and in the Indo-Pacific, that these threats are interconnected. Uh, even during the Cold War, if you remember, uh, when we competed against the Soviet Union, we had COCOM restrictions that prevented any dual use technology experts. If you look at the situation we're in today, we have taken the jewels in the crown of Western technology and handed it over for the past 30 years to 1.4 billion strong communist state. Uh, and now we're talking about this as though this can be managed. You cannot compete against an adversary and win if you at the same time depend on that adversary for critical supply chains. So I've been arguing and writing about for quite some time about the imperative of hard decoupling from China when it comes to critical supply chains, breaking their monopoly of the centralized controlled mercantilist system the Chinese have put in place, reshoring critical supplies, creating redundancies, especially when it comes to our weapon systems production. And then we may have in fact a workable strategy going forward. And last question, and maybe I will po pose it to the entire panel. Uh, we talk about strategic competition. What does the win look like? What is the end state that the West, the United States and our European allies want to achieve? Because as the cliche go, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. We'll continue to talk different methodologies. What is the end state in this great, this round of great power competition with China and Russia? Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, in the benefit of time, why don't we collect a couple of questions? If there's any anyone interested to come forward to the microphone and uh, I mean, is a, is a rare opportunity to be conducting this in person, so we really appreciate any, anyone having a question in the venue here. Yes, please. Alan Riley, Atlantic Council. Um, I agree with uh, Dr. Mishra about the importance of being able to get the, uh, the, the Europeans on board, and I know the UK is doing some issues here, but I do wonder if, as it becomes clearer that there is a very, very serious security problem with China, if you look in terms of um, the acquisition of strategic companies across Europe, particularly in uh, telecoms, in energy, in tech, that the Europeans begin to change their mind. There is actually, a, I think, a bit of hope that there is a broader European move on this. In October of 2020, the EU uh, adopted uh, a, a first step, CFIUS foreign investment uh, control regime. Okay, it's weak, it's not tremendously effective overall, but it's a first step, it's a first recognition, and that has actually triggered 
uh, a number of member states, there's still about nine member states who don't have any regime at all, but have started uh, triggering member states to think about this and look at it and look at ways of creating regimes to, to deal with this. And I think there is this, this actual uh, focus on foreign investment view, so it's quite away from security and warships, but what it does is it begins to change people's attitudes. It makes them focus on the issues to do with China. And I think it is perhaps a way of seeing a European recognition that there is a very serious security problem which has to be uh, dealt with and also provides a basis for significant US-EU cooperation. I'll stop there. That was my, obs my observation. But I think Dr. Kirschberger could also give us a sense of how you know, Europe might be changing the perception, also bearing in mind the German election, which is going mm. to result in a different government from the CDU. So what is your observation here? Sure. Yeah, I think actually China has been giving uh, China analysts a helping hand through its behavior since the start of the pandemic. It has basically, you could say, dropped the mask in some ways. Um, the malignant actions that we've seen coercing Australia when it called for an investigation of the pandemic origins or trying to inhibit Taiwan from uh, purchasing vaccines or using masks as a, like a bargaining chip uh, to coerce countries or its own vaccines as well. So these were behaviors that show that this is talking of China as a partner in these times is a little bit of a stretch in the light of the seriousness of the problems that the world was facing and China's actual you know, misusing of its leverage to gain political influence. So that was, uh, I think, uh, one of the reasons that has galvanized your opinions in Europe. So we've seen a significant shift, especially among the populations of Europe. So the governments are sometimes lagging behind the perception of the people that are ruled by those governments in terms of uh, how they see China. As to Germany, yes, we are in the middle of coalition talks, so nobody actually knows yet what the next government will look like. So it's a little bit speculative to guess what the China policy will be. But if we get this traffic-like coalition of the Social Democrats, the Free Democrats, and the Greens, I think at least one can guess that uh, the tendencies of the Social Democrats that we have in parts of that party to be a little bit on the appeasement side of things, especially regarding Russia, will perhaps be counteracted by the two smaller parties in that coalition. Because the Greens have a very strong focus on human rights, and have also uh, the, the leader of the Greens during the campaign has made it clear that she is in favor of a harder, more hard-nosed approach towards both Russia and China. And the Free Democrats have a very also credible, I think, history of taking some such uh, positions. We have, for instance, uh, the member of parliament, uh, Gudi Jensen, who is uh, a free democrat, He's, she's in charge of the Human Rights Committee. She has been very vocal, very, very strong regarding the challenges uh, in Hong Kong and so on. So the free democrats have also um, been very vocal also in their support for Taiwan and for Hong Kong. So I think both these parties will ex exercise pressure on the SPD if they were in a coalition with them. And I would even guess that the Free Democrats would walk out of such a coalition if um, the traditional, you know, uh, well, uh, way of some of the, uh, the left-wingers in the SPD towards the autocratic countries uh, would come to the forefront. That is my personal feeling, but uh, of course, no guarantees. We do not know what the next government will be like. Right, possible toughening of tone. Is anyone else from the audience also interested to ask our panelists a question? Yes, please. Yeah, maybe we can collect two questions. Yes, please. Wait. Well, I get first to the microphone, Julian. Uh, Thomas <laughs> Ermolaevich is uh, uh, ICDS in, in, in Tallinn. Uh, on Thursday, I had the pleasure of moderating a side event on the Indo-Pacific with speakers from India, Japan, uh, Australia. And one of the things that was brought up, and uh, uh, several panelists also spoke here, is, is Russia factor and Russia's growing alignment with China. Now we stumbled upon the, 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 the aspect that India's and Japan's approach uh, in the Quad format or, or, or outside is to engage Russia in the expectation that they will find a way to peel it away from China. What do you think? Is that a dangerously naive approach? 
and there is no way that, that, that this kind of alignment, growing alignment could be split? Or is, there, is it a viable course of action and there is maybe an opportunity for this kind of a divide and rule tactics? Thank you. Would you like to address your question to any particular? Well, anyone who is wishing to do it, and, and, and I, it's not only in Asia. We had Macron, for instance, also probably adv advocating a similar, similar approach. Why should you engage Russia? Because, you know, if, we, if they, they fall into China's camp, that, that basically undermines our long-term strategic interests. So maybe, you know, one, one of the panelists could comment on, on this. Sure, sure. And the second question, please. Thank you. Um, much of the debate has been characterized as the threat posed by China in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and the implications for the United States. But even if you take out the, the military kinetic side of things, uh, China is very active in Europe, uh, breach of world trade organization rules, intellectual property theft, theft cyber attacks, uh, industrial espionage. And I would like to know, maybe from Sarah, uh, actually, but also anyone who wants to comment, uh, um, what a European policy would be to deal with the behaviors, let's call it that, of China in non-military coercion and whether such an EU policy could indeed be, indeed be developed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kirschberger, maybe you can jump in here. Yeah, actually, um, on, the, on the peeling Russia away from China question, I um, have, a, have a couple of comments. So I think um, in order to assess this relationship between Russia and China, what really needs to be done is to look in depth at the empirical evidence that is there of their actual collaboration in the military security fields. So I'm actually in the process of doing that. We are working on a book project on that. Um, and it seems that there is so much going on that the, the, the usual general discussion is overlooking in terms of arms transfers, uh, high-tech, dual-use high-tech research, space collaboration, but also in the, in the, in the field of um, ballistic missile defense and, for instance, Russia providing early warning system for China. So the, if you look at the history of this collaboration, it has taken off from a very low level and it has developed very, very quickly and has reached unprecedented levels. And then you look at the synergistic options that China and Russia have. They are very highly compatible as partners. They are like each other's dream partners right now, I'm told, <laughs> sometimes by, by actors from those countries, because Russia has all the things that China needs and vice versa. So Russia has lots of empty space, little capital, but lots of natural resources, whereas China has excess capital, few resources, and needs some of Russia's military technologies. So there's there's really a lot that they can do with each other. Peeling Russia away from China at this point, I think, is unrealistic. But one can, of course, try to engage Russia as one should engage China and try to keep the channels open. But I think the trend of the times, especially also in the current climate where both countries are facing sanctions due to their aggressive behaviors in their own peripheries, it is really unrealistic to think that we could like make Russia and an offer it can't refuse and then drop its partnership with China. That's, I think, not going to work out. I'd like to bring in Jude here and pose the question from another perspective. We've seen, you know, state media from China portraying the C Putin relationship as romance almost. I mean, how solid is this relationship, strategically speaking? Um, I, I, don't, what's, I don't know the, how do I split the difference between solid and weak um, because the I think the, the discussion around this from Beijing's point of view is certainly that they see ample opportunity to strengthen the relationship with Russia over areas of emerging uh, ideological values interests vis-a-vis -vis the United States. The, the reason that this is more like a, uh, a dating relationship than a marriage though is of course the, the longstanding historical tensions between uh, Russia and China, they don't, they don't dominate the relationship anymore at, at all, but those were driven by um, areas of non-overlapping ideological, territorial, uh, and economic interests. So I think this is one where um, a new paradigm is possible to emerge where new areas of, of overlap, again, we just had joint military exercises between the two, um, and certainly the shared interest in a distaste for, for U.S., uh, leadership and NATO certainly brings the two powers together. Just as a final point, when you read sort of 
Beijing strategic writers who think about the relationship, um, they don't see Russia as an equal partner in, in any sense of, of the word. They see this as, a, as very much a junior partner. That doesn't mean that there's not significant areas of overlap, but it does point to some uh, weaknesses at the outer bounds. And just going back to the framing of the question on can we peel off Russia, you know, I think there's been good commentary here and also over the past few months since, since uh, that argument was made forcefully in, in foreign affairs. The, the, the thing that made the ability of the United States to peel uh, China off was the fact that the Sino-Soviet split was over a decade old. Um, there is no Sino-Soviet split that uh, a, a power like the United States could, could leverage to essentially peel, uh, peel Russia off. So that's an important, um, I think that's an important variable which isn't in play right now. Thank you. We have one more gentleman here, and I'll also get another question from our online audience, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, ben Hodges, Center for European Policy Analysis. My question will be to Sarah. I really agree with uh, Andrew Mista's uh, concern about a lack of urgency, uh, and I also agree with Admiral Davidson's uh, prediction about a kinetic conflict six, seven years from now, probably sooner, which doesn't mean necessarily Taiwan, of course. Uh, Sarah, what, what is the sense of urgency? I mean, you're an expert on Chinese shipbuilding. I mean, what could you talk about the sense of urgency that the Chinese Communist Party obviously has uh, about what they're doing and, and what's driving that sense of urgency? Thanks. Thank you. And we also have, uh, of course, you know, uh, this conference wouldn't be complete without a question on AUKUS. So I think uh, our experts on the American side could talk about, you know, the significance uh, or the impact of AUKUS uh, in terms of NATO's relations with China or Western relations with China. What is, how is China going to react in the next few years? But first, Dr. Kishberger. Okay, uh, so should I maybe pick the shipbuilding uh, question first? And I can connect sure. it to AUKUS actually. Sure. <laughs> so um, yeah, thank you very much, General Hodges for the question. Yeah, that is one of the reasons why I am so worried about China's intentions because the shipbuilding uh, the buildup that you see in China's Navy is really historically, uh, it is not completely without parallel in history, but almost. And what we've been seeing, they have been adding ships at a rate that one doesn't usually associate with peacetime modernization. So it's not just replacement procurement for obsolete units, it's really a build up and the capacity gains are significant. So China has been adding offensive power projection platforms, not just a couple of aircraft carriers, but helicopter carriers, uh, huge numbers of them actually. So eight, uh, eight of these new type 75 are planned, perhaps eight more. And this, the older 71 type is going to be like the backbone of that fleet. So this is a huge capability that many people sort of overlook only focusing on the aircraft carriers. They have added within just eight years time they have commissioned 72 corvettes. And that's a ship class that the Chinese Navy didn't even have before those corvettes came into the fleet. Within just five years of time, between 2014 and 2018, that's a calculation by the IISS, they have added in measured in tons of steel the equivalent of the entire Royal Navy to the already large Chinese Navy. So that's the dimensions that we're talking about in terms of just the platforms, not even counting the weapon systems that are on board these platforms. And the problem is, this is such a huge investment. So I used to work in the naval shipbuilding industry, so I have a sense of what this costs, how much the procurement costs, how much the maintenance and the operation of such an individual platform costs. So looking at this huge investment, I find it very hard to believe this is just a symbolic thing. This is just for signaling something. This is just not very convincing an argument. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so worried. I think they are building, they're trying to build overwhelming military superiority in that region with an attempt to create a situation where their goals, such as obtaining control over Taiwan, will fall into their laps like an overripe apple. That's basically what I think is behind that, right. it's so oh. intimidating. Right, since time is running out, maybe uh, Professor Ha could jump in here on AUKUS. You know, Europe is also talking about European defense as a parallel or, you know, complementary to NATO. I mean, as an American in Europe, how do you see this? 
Well, well, certainly, I think there's there has been um, certainly the French view at AUKUS has been, and this is the the points that I was making that there's this worry about your about what America's doing, what Biden's doing, and is he as sure-footed? But I think on the other hand, there wasn't too much um, controversy about, or wasn't a lot of people at the different nation-state level that were echoing what what France was echoing. So I think that Europe does think that Indo-Pacific is where the the history is going to be made. That's what they want to play a role as well. And I think they see that AUKUS is going to be a very important new step in the region and that they will want to also be a part of that. But I, I think that you certainly know. So maybe you we, could say something from the Chinese perspective because that's what also your question was AUKUS, about. We, I forgot to say that. I th I'm a big fan of AUKUS. So I'm a self-confessed AUKUS fan. I think it's exactly the right signal to China, actually, to maybe change the risk calculus and give them feedback on how the other parts of the world are perceiving what China is doing. I think that is really the function of AUKUS that's so important right now. Right. So coming from a German perspective, I endorse AUKUS. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are running out of time, but thank you so much again for joining us, and thank you to our uh, panelists joining from America on virtual chat, and hopefully we'll be seeing you in person next year in the Riga Conference 2022. Uh, but until then, stay safe, and thank you again for joining.